Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left John McClernand, the President just gave him the rank of Brigadier General with instructions to keep Southern Illinois in the Union. But as the war progressed through its first year, McClernand was determined to lead his men into battle. Senator Orville Browning, who replaced Stephen Douglas in the Senate after Douglas' death, spoke to Lincoln, General-in-Chief Winfield Scott, and the Secretary of War about McClernand. The Secretary of War sent a letter to the Governor of Illinois as a result of his meeting, instructing him to afford McClernand all the facilities in your power for arming and equipping his brigade for service at the earliest date possible. McClernand took this letter to mean that he and his brigade took priority over all Illinois units when it came to getting outfitted for the war. He overstepped his power when he made a deal contracting with British agents to supply his brigade with 4,000 British-made infield rifled muskets, citing a letter from the Secretary of War to the Illinois governor giving him the authority to do so. He also obligated the Illinois government to pay for these weapons. McClernand also acted as a politician, even when he took on the role as general. He personally wrote to the Quartermaster General to set up a fund of $25,000 for which he could draw from to field his brigade. By the end of August, McClernand and his men would be assigned to the Western Department, commanded by John C. Fremont and headquartered at St. Louis. When McClernand wrote to Fremont about the need of supplies, Fremont informed John that he needed to submit a request to the quartermaster for the Western Department. Undoubtedly, McClernand was taken aback by this type of formality when he was used to being a politician, where he communicated directly with politicians of any position because of his clout. Fremont assigned McClernand to protect in southern Illinois, along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Ulysses S. Grant, now in command of the District of Southeast Missouri, placed his headquarters in southern Illinois. A small squabble between Grant and McClernand emerged when John failed to take command of a post since he was the senior ranking officer. In fairness to McClernand, he had been ordered to occupy that area, not take command of the area. Still, Grant got angry at McClernand's inaction. When Confederate General Leonidas Polk invaded Kentucky and occupied Columbus, this gave the Union the ability to invade the declared neutral state. Grant, with troops from McClernand's force, crossed the river and occupied Paducah, Kentucky. McClernand expertly organized his troops and the transports to make the expedition possible. Grant complimented McClernand by saying, I must acknowledge my obligations to General McClernand, commanding his force for the active and efficient cooperation exhibited by him in fitting out this expedition. For the next few months, McClernand coordinated the movement of troops through his post in southern Illinois, equipped soldiers, coordinated with the quartermaster, made sure adequate rations were issued to each soldier, and did general paperwork that kept the army together. His 12-year-old son, Edward, would join him in the field around this time, gaining a great appreciation and fascination with the army. He did have to deal with his soldiers drinking heavily in the nearby towns, which caused trouble in the ranks. Grant issued an order authorizing McClernand to arrest anyone frequenting the drinking establishments. John wrote to Grant that had his troops been kept in Springfield, like he requested, his troops would not have indulged themselves in the saloons. He also reminded Grant that when he took command of the area, he suggested declaring martial law so that he could shut down those types of businesses, but Grant refused to do so. By November, McClernand would outlaw the sale of alcohol in the city entirely because of the constant problems that arose from soldiers ingesting the spirits. The biggest problem affecting McClernand's command was a lack of weapons. The 4,000 infields had yet to arrive, and Fremont had only sent 500 weapons to the brigade since being garrisoned in southern Illinois. What the men did have were old flintlock rifles, either that they brought with them to enlist, or were issued from old stock put aside by the state or local municipalities. The problem was that every brigade in the Union suffered from a lack of weapons early in the war, and the fact that McClernand's regiments signed up later than many put them further down on the list of recipients. He did see a little hope that got dashed quickly when the 4,000 rifles arrived from Britain, but the governor could not secure them because too many units and governors of other states sought them out. A reorganization by Grant gave McClernand more troops, demonstrating the confidence Grant and others put in McClernand's abilities. Both McClernand and John Logan renewed their oratory skills when they traveled to a post where a unit refused to re-enlist. After a speech from each man, the entire unit decided to re-enlist for the three-year stint. 
In November, McClernand received 28 copies of Hardy's Light Infantry Tactics to help him and the other officers in his brigade to understand the Manual of Arms, Army Regulations, and how to drill the troops. During the fall of 1861, Grant journeyed to Springfield and St. Louis, which took him three days to accomplish, meeting with politicians and military officials. He left McClernand in command during his absence. As the commander, McClernand canceled all soldiers on hospital detail so they could drill with the rest of the regiments. He was taking his military duties seriously and believed that able-bodied soldiers on hospital detail threatened the integrity of his force by not allowing them to train with the rest of the brigade. This put John in conflict with the medical director, who complained to Grant. When the commander returned, Grant rescinded McClernand's order, but there seems to be no hard feelings between any of the three men during that situation. At the beginning of November, Grant finally gave McClernand what he wanted, a taste of battle. The district commander sent his brigades downriver toward the little community of Belmont, where Confederate activity gave great concern to Union authorities in the area. On November 6th, McClernand and his brigade loaded onto transports. By 8.30 the next morning, McClernand and his force disembarked about three and a half miles north of Belmont. Not knowing the terrain or region, McClernand went with his scouts to observe the landscape over which his men would move. This became a common practice for the general and one that would help him maneuver his troops over vastly different terrains. He would not solely rely on reports, he wanted to see the areas personally. McClernand deployed his men and marched south toward the Confederate camps, but came into contact with Confederate cavalry. Then, after pushing them aside, Confederate infantry massed in their front. McClernand could be found at the head of his brigade, hat in hand, directing his regiments. His horse became wounded, but still carried the general despite other bullets mangling the harness. The general pushed back the Confederate infantry to their camps, and then ordered a general charge that sent the Southerners running. The blue troops now occupied the rebel works, raising the United States flag up the flagpole and pilfering the camp for trophies. The pillaging and chaos got so bad that Grant ordered the camp burned. The Union troops celebrated until the enemy began to regroup and counterattack. McClernand led his troops out of the works and fought their way out, but the battle disorganized his troops. John's horse got wounded a second time on the retreat, and a bullet grazed John's head, but the Union brigade made it to safety minus one regiment. Confederates pursued the Union forces and shot at the blue troops boarding the transports. McClernand worried as the boat sped away about the 27th Illinois Infantry. They became disconnected from the brigade during the fight, and after traveling across the battlefield twice, McClernand was unable to locate them. As they steamed up the Mississippi, McClernand ordered the pilot of the transport to dock on the Missouri side of the river. The general did not go far before he met a staff member from the 27th. The regiment boarded the transport and the brigade went back to camp. The Battle of Belmont at best could be considered a draw, but northern newspapers described it as a loss, asking for Grant to be relieved of command for committing such a blunder. McClernand, on the other hand, gained great notoriety from some of the newspapers and was declared the savior of the day. Still, at least one newspaper accused Grant and McClernand of being cowards in the battle, who did not stay with their men. That statement couldn't be further from the truth. Grant wrote to his father about the Battle of Belmont, saying, General McClernand acted with great coolness and courage throughout, and proved that he is a soldier as well as a statesman. In his report, he said, General McClernand was in the midst of danger throughout the engagement, and displayed both coolness and judgment. 